Um, you mentioned Taiwan, uh, and that's perfect segue into, let's call you His Excellency the Ambassador to Taiwan. <laughs> <laughs> Doug, the floor is yours. Well, th thank you very much, and thank you to WPC and the organizers for this opportunity to share the stage and share so many learning opportunities in the, as a member of the audience. Um, I'd like to start by framing uh, my perspective on where we are with China in the Indo-Pacific today. Uh, in terms of the, the revolutionary challenge that China presents, China has... Um, you know, is, is now, I think, the fourth in a series of revolutionary challenges to the international system that we've seen since the Napoleonic Wars, which in that case ended in the defeat of France and the rebuilding of Asia by patient and, and complicated diplomatic work uh, at that time. The next great revolutionary challenge was the fascist challenge, which was defeated in war. And again, the victors made the determination of how it would uh, be managed in the aftermath, and then the Cold War came along in the after and the uh, Soviet Union represented a revolutionary challenge to the world, but it had an inward focus. It didn't really carry itself out to the same extent. And today we find China under guise of, of revising the international system, but increasingly talking about revolutionizing that system and changing it fundamentally. And uh, China, unlike the previous defeated Napoleonic or defeated fascist forces or the, the collapsed uh, Soviet Cold War era, the China today um, has a, still has a foot in the, the world as we know it, the, the, the rules-based order. It's been profiting from that. But it also wants to change it. So I think we need to look in the long term at how we're going to find a new equilibrium, a new way to manage this Chinese uh, um, uh, ambition. Uh, China, as a result of being a, a product of four decades of involvement in the international system, of investment in China, and China's becoming the major uh, trading and manufacturing partner for most of the world, uh, China has also made itself vulnerable. It has, it has to protect those interests as it goes forward with its own ambitions. Um, <coughs> the uh, Biden administration came to office having inherited a chaotic approach to China in the Indo-Pacific under Donald Trump. Um, if you recall, I think some mention was made earlier today of the finger pointing that went on in Anchorage, Alaska between the American diplomatic representatives and the Chinese and the Chinese complained that the U.S. said it wanted to deal with China from a position of strength and derided that American position. Well, we had a couple of years pass by, and the U.S. has, and the Biden administration has worked hard to, to reconstitute our, the quality of our relations to that which prevailed before the Trump administration came to office. And we saw the U.S. and Japanese and Korean alliances strengthened. The alphabet soup has been mentioned of AUKUS and the, uh, strengthening the Pacific Islands. We've been ignoring the Pacific Islands for 20 years, but China woke us up to our interests and concerns there. Uh, we have the AUKUS arrangement, which I, I'm hoping will be something material, but it's still a promise, not really a, a reality. And the, and the, and the Quad. And today, as Biden prepares to host Xi Jinping at the APEC meeting in San Francisco, I think he can take satisfaction that compared to two years ago in the Anchorage meetings, uh, the United States now is in a much greater position of strength to deal with China as they go forward. Now, um, the, the APEC meeting uh, will mark only one moment in the continuing competition between the U.S. China, despite a slowing economy, uh, it continues to develop unprecedented military capabilities. Um, the U.S. is challenged to uh, upgrade its own military capabilities while being uh, compelled to provide assistance to Ukraine and now to the Israelis in Gaza. Uh, the U.S. is also challenged by having old habits that have not been revised to meet modern requirements. 
The, our military industry has fallen behind. Our, the ways of dealing with the military industry through Congress and through the Defense Department need to be upgraded. Our, our processes are slow. There are multiple demands on resources. Domestic demands are up because the American people are tired of paying for uh, maintenance of the peace around the world. They want a peace dividend. Uh, all of these uh, are, are, are putting pressure on the U.S. in ways that make it uh, not easy for the U.S. to simply you know, enter into a confrontation or make a series of demands. We have to find ways to, to chisel away at our problems in the Asia-Pacific region, in the Indo-Pacific region. And, and China will work all the while to make these harder. I understand China has announced that it's willing to be hosting a Hamas delegation shortly. Um, there are, China has interests in the Middle East. They need energy from the Middle East more than the United States does. But we both have an interest in keeping the energy supplies from the Middle East going forward. And there's a, there's a basis for a kind of uh, standoffish cooperation between the U.S. and China on restoring peace in the, in the Middle East. But that has to be explored. It has to be uh, found. And that's not uh, present. Uh, at the moment, China seems to be rather eager to take advantage of the distress the Middle East is causing and hope that the U.S. will be further distracted from the Taiwan and, West, and the Asia Pacific uh, sets of challenges that China is posing. Um, the, the main area where the United States is falling behind, hasn't done enough to re-strengthen its position, is economic. Uh, we should never have walked away from TPP in 2016 and the end of the Clinton campaign. Uh, we should be talking about CPTP, TPP. Uh, we, uh, IPEC is a, you know, it's a worthy effort, but it's not, it's not a, a substantial and attractive uh, offer for the parties in the region who have become increasingly dependent on trade and investment uh, with China itself. And I'm not optimistic that either the Democrats or the Republicans, should they take power in the next administration, would be willing to bite the bullet on uh, dealing with the economic challenges that we face in the, in the Indo-Pacific. Now, a word about Taiwan, where I, I served as an unofficial ambassador. Um, this is now, remains, the most dangerous flashpoint in the Indo-Pacific uh, region. Over the past year, the Biden administration has, in my view, retreated from its more confrontational approach to our past agreements with China on how to manage Taiwan affairs. We had an era, an era where, starting with the end of the Trump administration and through the beginning of the Biden administration, the U.S. was sort of pushing the envelope on official dealings with the people of Taiwan. Um, since May of this year, when uh, Jake Sullivan, the national security advisor, and China's counterpart Wang Yi met in Vienna, the U.S. has been walking the line more carefully. It's uh, what I call a, a restoration of diplomatic discipline. This is not, not something you do alone. You don't just retreat and uh, yield to Chinese demands, but you also pair that with an effort to strengthen Taiwan's ability to deter aggression. China's growing military capabilities uh, can't be dismissed, but they can't be confronted directly either, except at great cost. The question is how to find the balance between deterrence and diplomatic discipline that keeps the peace in the, in the Asia-Pacific re region. <clears throat> What's the outlook for the 21st century in the, in the Indo-Pacific? In my view, Xi Jinping and his revolutionary ambitions look to dominate the next decade or more uh, with Xi himself in charge. And um, the, a mixture of discipline and deterrence will be required if the U.S., despite competition for national priorities at home, uh, and leadership in other parts of the world uh, will have to have a sustained, steady, measure-by-measure -measure approach to the Indo-Pacific. My belief, however, is that the, the, the people of China and that the China we know today of Xi Jinping is not forever. And as we move forward in our efforts to uh, incentivize peaceful resolution of disputes uh, in the Indo-Pacific and make the alternative of using force unattractive, we also should keep the door open to the Chinese people at all times so that they understand that our competition is not with 
the people of China, but with the behavior of a certain government in China. And that if China is willing to change its behavior, the U.S. will be willing to cooperate to help make a 21st century that achieves what the Congress of Vienna did in the 18th century and what the, 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 the bright men and women of the uh, end of the World War II period did to establish a way of maintaining a balance in global affairs to uh, stem this revolutionary uh, disruption and to allow us to build a, a peaceful future. So thank you for that. Thank you very much indeed, Doug. Um, I, I note that you are not allowing Xi Jinping to be immortal. You have a, a time limit for him. Um, do you have a guess at when China will change? You know, I, I have been lucky enough to know a lot of Chinese for quite a few years. And, and when we can get together, I think they're pretty frank about the shortcomings of their current leadership. But they're also frank about the risks of, t of ch taking on the current leadership. So the question is waiting out the current leadership and, and not closing doors to a more cooperative and productive future between China and the various uh, the countries of the region and the world for the matter.